Hello, everybody. My name is Roger Walker, and I'm head of the CubeSat Systems Unit at the European Space Agency. I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to address you today with this keynote speech. And I'll be talking to you about uh, ESA's technology CubeSats and how we're using CubeSats for in orbit technology demonstration in order to enable future operational missions. So to start with, uh, why are we interested in CubeSats at ESA? Well, we can see that CubeSats offer a drastic uh, reduction in the entry level cost for space missions. They're fast to develop, and due to their small size, uh, they're acting as a driver for miniaturization. Those factors make them ideal for uh, technology in orbit demonstration, and particularly allowing um, open access to space for new space actors such as new member states of ESA, uh, small medium enterprises, research institutes, and so on. Due to their small uh, size and low cost, we can also see that they're enabling highly distributed autonomous systems in the future, and particularly in the form of constellations, uh, swarms, and fleets can be offering uh, unique applications that couldn't be done by single large monolithic spacecraft. So uh, since 2019, we've had uh, the CubeSat Systems Unit established. This is the first organizational unit in our organization for CubeSats. And we have a number of objectives in the unit, and that's particularly to utilize CubeSat platforms uh, to demonstrate new technologies such that we can use them for uh, our larger missions. There are a couple of examples there we have. Um, we also have the objective to rapidly advance uh, the state of the art in European CubeSat systems such that we can harness those platforms to offer new operational missions and also um, use our technology demonstrations to um, validate new diverse end use applications for CubeSats uh, and also build up European uh, competitiveness in this very dynamic market that's going on right now. We're acting as a focal point for um, CubeSats within the agency and also externally, and also offer uh, specific CubeSat support to our programs in ESA, which are now starting up their own CubeSat projects. So uh, we do have a, a portfolio of in-orbit demonstration missions. Five have been launched already, and uh, we have another um, six currently in development and another four beyond that in definition. Quite a few of those missions are targeted at demonstrating small payloads, uh, particularly for instance, for earth science, space weather and uh, space science. But we also have missions which are targeting drastic improvements in uh, platform performances and demonstrating new system capabilities like rendezvous and docking, for instance, as well as beyond LEO missions. We are working together with industry and research institutes in Europe. Um, our programs uh, consist of more than 12 missions uh, with more than 30 million euros dedicated in funding in our general support technology program since 2013. And we are working with over three, uh, 30 companies and institutes uh, right the way across Europe. And you can just see um, from most countries in Europe, we do uh, engage with, with different companies. If we look at the evolution of the CubeSat at ESA, uh, we can see dating back to our first mission, GOMEX-3 in 2015, up to um, a mission GOMEX-5, which we plan to launch next year. Um, there has been a rapid growth in size and um, significant advances in performance, such that they can undertake real operational missions for the future. Now, uh, you can see, for instance, uh, platform sizes have increased from 3U up to 12U quite drastically. Um, power has increased uh, significantly, pointing performance, uh, downlink data rates have increased. Uh, we're also introducing propulsion into uh, CubeSats now um, since 2018. 
and uh, we'll be making improvements in maneuverability of CubeSats in the future. Going towards uh, deep space missions, uh, that performance will be driven even further with technology investments in our technology program, for instance, with our MARGO mission. If we look uh, at the evolution programmatically for CubeSats in Europe, we can see that um, CubeSats dated back to 2005, particularly with an educational wave using CubeSats for hands-on education, as in most of the world. Um, then we have a second uh, wave, which is an experimental wave for CubeSats technology demonstration missions, starting up for around, from around 2010, where ESA got involved, uh, other government agencies in Europe, and of course, industry since that time. That's actually now leading to a third wave uh, of operational missions. And uh, that's been going on since around 2018 onwards, where CubeSats um, from industry and government agencies for institutional missions have been starting to launch uh, operational CubeSats. And if you look at those missions, uh, what's currently ongoing and what's planned in the future, we can categorize uh, those missions in three pillars. Firstly, LEO constellations, close proximity operations missions, and beyond LEO science and exploration missions. Looking at future LEO constellation applications, uh, there have been quite a number of studies that have been done, funded by the agency in the past. And uh, throughout our programs now, um, we are starting to see applications, for instance, in Earth observation for high resolution atmospheric monitoring, global tropospheric measurements for weather prediction, change detection of land, uh, flood and fire hazards, for instance. Also uh, for telecom purposes, the applications there range from uh, Internet of Things, ship and aircraft tracking, and also space weather, uh, for instance, um, for uh, forecasting space weather, monitoring aspects like ionosphere, radiation, and uh, magnetospheric uh, measurements and so on. Out of all these uh, evolutions for the applications of constellations, we do see a trend for larger platforms up to 12 and 16U for more payload volume. Also reorbiting and deorbiting satellites end of life, particularly uh, providing inter-satellite links and high data rate downlinks on the communication side. And uh, there are trends towards higher power generation for supporting communications and electric propulsion particularly. Now, when we do see operations of large constellations, of course, um, there are needs there and trends for higher onboard autonomy for managing the fleets. And uh, we're pushing more towards autonomous station keeping, station acquisition and deorbiting. So all on the guidance, navigation and control side, as well as data networking throughout the constellation. An example of uh, next generation technology demonstration is the GOMEX-5 mission. That's done with GOMSpace in Denmark. It's a 12U CubeSat. It will be demonstrating um, large orbit transfers using electric propulsion, principally the thrust me propulsion system. It will be demonstrating uh, high data rate downlink expand communications, more than 200 megabits per second to ground uh, using a reflector array high gain antenna. Also uh, high accuracy GNSS, uh, high precision receivers, demonstrating uh, 10 centimeter accuracy for future onboard orbit determination, as well as a number of different uh, payloads from European industry. So. Currently, the project is uh, coming up for critical design review in July, and we plan to launch it into sun synchronous orbit uh, around mid next year. Moving on to close proximity operations here, uh, we do see uh, applications in this area related to on orbit assembly for large space structures, uh, on orbit servicing of larger satellites and possible upgrade of, of larger satellites using CubeSats. Also close inspection and repair, both for large, uh, larger satellites and space stations and uh, potentially space debris objects as well. In addition, there are applications we see in swarm formations forming sparse apertures 
particularly in multi-static radar uh, interferometry and uh, optical um, three-dimensional three observations. The key technologies here are related to um, close proximity navigation, so vision-based navigation. Docking ports uh, need to be standardized uh, with their interfaces. And also for long-range navigation, um, both relative and absolute uh, GNSS navigation is needed um, and being developed in our technology program. We need also to develop um, robust and accurate guidance navigation and control systems with a particular emphasis on um, fault detection and collision avoidance maneuvers uh, for close proximity ops to avoid, of course, in orbit collisions been between chaser and target. Last but not least, uh, we are also developing a six degree of freedom propulsion systems for CubeSats, and those are particularly uh, needing low minimum impulse bit uh, firings in order to enable that fine control for, for close proximity maneuvers. We do have a planned IOD mission for this, it's called RACE, the Rendezvous Autonomous CubeSats experiment. Uh, that reached preliminary design review already. Here, the mission concept involves two six-unit CubeSats launched together uh, to perform a sequence of docking and close fly-around maneuver experiments uh, in order to test out different GNC algorithms. Post-race mission, uh, this would enable, enable, of course, as I said, autonomous on-orbit assembly, uh, and also uh, inspection missions to be uh, de-risked. Moving on to future beyond LEO missions, um, it's fair to say we do see a high potential for uh, technology miniaturization and CubeSats to cut the entry-level uh, cost of interplanetary missions by up to an order of magnitude, bringing in uh, new actors into space exploration domain stimulating uh, single spacecraft uh, demo missions at low cost. And then after that, uh, being able to deploy and operate fleets of nano spacecraft distributed in, in interplanetary space. So for instance, the applications uh, for these new architectures could involve a wide survey of the near Earth asteroid population for science, planetary defense, and um, of course, resource exploration purposes. There are also applications we see in um, simultaneous in situ monitoring of space weather in the heliocentric uh, space, multiple uh, locations, potentially using reconfigurable swarms, and also constellations in lunar and Mars orbit, for instance, for lunar uh, or Mars comms relay and navigation. Uh, simultaneous uh, global uh, coverage for remote sensing as well. So there are a number of different projects uh, that are being studied for implementation right now. Uh, that includes LUMIO, the Lunar Meteoroid Impacts Observer. That's just completed phase A. It will uh, aim to demonstrate um, a high frame rate camera for observations of meteoroid impacts on the lunar far side from the Earth-Moon uh, L2 halo orbit and using a chemical um, monopropellant a propulsion system to maneuver from uh, a deployment in lunar orbit to the L2 point. The other one which is currently being studied, uh, just completed phase A feasibility study, that's VMMO, Volatile and Mineralogy Mapping Orbiter. Uh, that is planned for operations in uh, low lunar orbit and uh, to make observations particularly of uh, water ice in the craters of the south pole of the moon at high resolution using an active laser spectrometer uh, instrument payload. The plan there would be to use uh, electric uh, propulsion to maneuver from the deployment orbit in, in lunar orbit down to low altitudes to perform those measurements. We also have in our space safety program, uh, the HERA mission. HERA is a larger mission to the Didymos asteroid for planetary defense purposes. And uh, the main HERA spacecraft, as you can see here, um, will be carrying along two six unit CubeSats on board 
Juventus and Milani, they're called, to be deployed at the Didymos asteroid to make close proximity observations uh, of the asteroid, including the interior structure with low frequency radar observations and multispectral imaging observations of the uh, Didy Moon uh, surface. Last but not least, we have a very ambitious project called MARGO, the Miniaturized Asteroid Remote Geophysical Observer. That's a mission that's again just fe uh, completed phase A. The objectives here are to uh, demonstrate technologies for standalone deep space CubeSats in the deep space environment to rendezvous with the near Earth object and to characterize its <coughs> physical properties. Um, it's a 12 unit CubeSat and uh, the technologies to be demonstrated are a gridded iron engine, a very high delta V, uh, thruster pointing mechanism, coal gas for reaction control, an X-band transponder, the reflector array high gain antenna and a high power steerable deployable solar array. So this will enable um, standalone CubeSats to be deployed in deep space for specific missions in the future. The plan here is to develop these technologies in our uh, pr technology program, finally integrate those together in a system and launch that in around 2024 to 2025 and execute the mission to a near-Earth asteroid. In summary, um, we see that CubeSat systems are becoming more capable. Uh, they can support future operational missions including for constellations, close pro proximity operations, as well as beyond low Earth orbit missions. And those are due to rapid advances in a number of different areas, including propulsion, uh, small payloads, pointing and position accuracy, communications and uh, guidance, navigation and control and onboard autonomy. We are harnessing those technologies at ESA uh, from our technology program to perform um, a number of IOD missions with CubeSats. It's quite a broad portfolio. We're aim aiming to uh, pull through the technology and demonstrate uh, the utility of CubeSats for end use applications such as uh, space science, earth science, space weather, in orbit assembly and servicing, and finally lunar and deep space exploration. All of these missions are, of course, aimed at um, advancing the state of the art and enabling new capabilities to be exploited in the future. So thank you for your attention. Um, and I'd be, of course, happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. <laughs>